All right, sorry to interrupt your uh, cake, but good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Mary Meyer Cook Athenaeum. My name is Bruno Yoon. I'm one of the Athenaeum fellows this year. And I'm going to start this introduction by throwing shade, not at anyone in particular, but a specific mentality. And there is a certain particularly irritating mentality that, with only mild exaggeration, sees only two possible postgraduate outcomes for majors that aren't STEM, barista or unemployed bum, nothing else. I have gotten many reactions along this line of thought when I explain to people that I'm a PPE or philosophy, politics, and economics major. And the further outside the small liberal arts college bubble you venture, the more common this view of education becomes. I imagine many of you have extended family members who think like this when you talk to them about what you're studying. And I also imagine that, when, when, that many of them, when you tell them that you go to Claremont Mechanic College, they ask you, where are you going to transfer for your four-year degree? <laughs> But in all honesty, this view of education is a bit disheartening because even though we need STEM majors to develop and perfect new technology, we need liberal arts people to deal with its political, economic, and social implications, among many other things. And so here to discuss one of the historical proponents of wide education, Winston Churchill, is Larry Arne, who is president of Hillsdale College in Michigan. He's, he's also a professor of politics and history there. He got his master's and PhD in government from what was then Claremont Graduate School. He also studied at Oxford, where he served as director of research for Sir Martin Gilbert. He's the official biographer of Winston Churchill. And from 1985 to 2000, he was president of the Claremont Institute for the Study of Statesmanship and Political Philosophy. President Arne is also on the board of directors for the Salvatore Center here at CMC, who, by the way, is co-sponsoring this presentation. And before we begin this talk, um, a couple of things. At head table, we were debating different conceptions of the good. And the ad's conception of the good is that you please silence and put away your cell phones at this time, and that you not record this talk audio or visually. And this talk will last about 45 minutes, giving us about 30 minutes for Q&A. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Larry Arn. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you, Humsa, who worked very hard, and Priya, who makes this place run. It's good to be with you all. Uh, I used to go to the old Athenaeum. Jack Stark and Jill Stark built this one and established many of its patterns. And uh, there's so many people here I've known since I was a kid, and that's you know, a really long time ago. <laughs> Ward Elliott. Uh, goodness gracious, Mark Blitz. You know, when I wrote my doctoral qualifying exams here, I was given an essay by the young scholar from Harvard, Mark Blitz. I don't know where he was then. And I was asked to comment on it. And I attacked it. <laughs> it was something about Heidegger you wrote. And I thought, this is foolish, so I just wrote a real screed against it. And Professor Jaffa liked it. <laughs> and, uh, later, your colleague. Uh, so it's fun to be back here. Uh, there's actually a building at Hillsdale College that is inspired by this building. And I've told them stories about this place a million times and what goes on in it. And I'm proud to be here to be part of it. Uh, so uh, Churchill uh, and education is an odd topic because Churchill never really got one. Um, it's important, though, for two reasons. And they're both unusual reasons. One is. Uh, Winston Churchill did several things that without any question altered the world in ways that affect us today. The fact that he lived. There's a, there's a room in London and on the 28th of May 1940 he walked in that room and if anybody else had walked in that room with the job that he had, Britain would have surrendered or made a peace with Hitler at that moment. Everybody else in the room was intending that. And it wasn't just that he didn't want that. It's not just that I vote no. He talked him into it. Think of the responsibility of that. Now, that's the first thing. And the second thing is education is terribly important, right? Because it, it comes from a Latin word that means to lead forth. And that means it constitutes an answer to the question, which way is forth? Which way should we go? And it's the most disinterested answer to the question that we give because it's something we say to the future. All of you in this room, and there's you know all the old folks in this room who are friends of mine, 
They've actually given their lives to serving you. And you're young and ignorant. And they're old and learned. And why would they do that? And then they have scruples about what they do. They think that they should say you to you the thing that's right. So now you see, here's this guy, and he had this enormous consequence in the world about questions of right and wrong. Questions that, by the way, involve the deaths of more people ever killed in a human conflict than any other. And indeed, he was at the center of the two things that were like that. And then education, which he didn't have, but then the interesting fact arises that he talked about it all the time. Isn't that funny? Hamsa is from Bangalore. And the most revealing thing that Ed, uh, Winston Churchill wrote about his own education is called Education at Bangalore. Where'd she go? Too bad, she's missing her hometown now. And uh, he was stationed there as a soldier. He was 22 years old, and he had not gone to college. Indeed, he, he was a, uh, you probably know, he was a very willful person. And when he was a young man, he was a very willful young man. And that means it was very hard to get him to study anything he didn't want to study. Now, he was a much better student than he let on, but he was not a good enough student to go to Oxford, for example. He found his uh, fun in his life in any formal way when he got to the cavalry school and he got to ride horses all day and practice stabbing and shooting people. And he really liked that. And then he says, it was not until my 22nd year that the desire for learning came upon me. It's very charming, this thing. Churchill had a gift that most politicians lack today. He could talk at great length about himself and not seem to be bragging, although if you read carefully, he usually was. So what did he read? He read, uh, he said he read the classics. He read, uh, he, he, the way he puts the point is, he said, uh, He'd heard the phrase many times, the Sermon on the Mount is the last word in Christian ethics. And then he asked a really Socratic question. I wondered, what are ethics? What does that mean? What kind of thing is that? You know, the classics uh, in, in the dialogues, Blitz over there, and Charles Kessler know all about this stuff, probably several of you do. But they're always asking the question in Greek, TST, what is a thing? What is that thing? What is the name of that thing? What is the meaning of that name of that thing? And so, what is ethics? He says, I would have paid somebody two pounds, a lot of money there back then, to give me a compendious lecture on the question of ethics for an hour or an hour and a half. And see, Blitz and Charles Kessler, two pounds in that money, they do it in a heartbeat, <laughs> you know. They get paid less than that now to do it. <laughs> but see, it was valuable to him, right? And then he says, I kept hearing about this guy, Socrates. Who was that guy? What did he do, he said. He seemed to be like some nuisance who was always causing people trouble. And he had a nagging wife. And he said uh, he, said he was uh, always giving people the head in their, their head in their argument and making them look like fools. And so they killed him, right? I wanted the Socrates story, he said. Think about the perspective of that. This is sort of like what Bruno said in introducing me. I wanted to know that thing. That's why I wanted it. I didn't want it to sell it. I didn't want to advance myself with it. Churchill, by the way, was very much into personal advancement. And his particular method of doing it was to go onto a battlefield and expose himself to gunfire. He did it once by an arbor train. He did many very brave things and it was written about in five wars that he fought in, including the First World War. And he was never on a battlefield that somebody didn't leave a record. Wow, watch that guy. The, maybe the brave, most spectacular brave thing he did, he wasn't even a soldier, he was a journalist. And he saved an armored train and, and uh, in, in South Africa. And he walked out with gunfire going all around him all the time for an hour. And everybody was just, you know, like that. And when it was over, 
he walked up to the captain. And remember, he was just a journalist. And you know why he was a journalist? He was a journalist because they would passed a, a, a regulation in the British Army that serving officers could not write for the press. And they pressed that because of him. Because in all of the wars in which he fought in before he got into Parliament when he was 26 years old, he was the most famous commentator on those wars, a second lieutenant, and he would criticize the generals. They hated that. So they passed a regulation he couldn't do it. So what he would do is resign his commission for a few months and write a bunch of articles, and then he joined back up. So on this day, he saves this train, and he walks up to the captain, his name was Haldane, and, he, and they knew each other, and he said, thank you for letting me do that. Do you see the assumption in there? He was sort of assuming everybody wanted to do that. He said, the whole Derbyshire Light Infantry has seen me do that, and now I'm going to be elected to Parliament. <laughs> That's a, you know, by the way, if he met you guys, you know, so smart and so well-placed, so handsome, all of you, it's amazing. You got everything. It's, I envy it. Youth, too. He would, he would say, how old are you? And whatever you said, he would say, you know, by the time he was a year older than you, Napoleon had done X. You got one year. <laughs> you know, conquered Italy, taken Toulon, you know, you got, you got a year, go do it, you know. That's how he thought about the youth, right? And I, I mention these aspects of his character because when he starts writing this thing in, in this chapter called My Early, a book called My Early Life, it's a very charming book, all of a sudden he names something that he's doing without any other motive except to do it. That's a whole disposition. Bruno made a, a joke. You know, you guys all think this, right? You're here at this fancy college. Your prospects are excellent. Most people don't get in here. Most people, by the way, don't even try. And of the ones who try, most don't make it. And so you're privileged now. And that encourages you to think, I'm doing this so I can get that. Winston Churchill, the guy who couldn't make himself go to college when he was your age, he condemns that. He says, uh, later in his life, he says, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to read a bit from a very beautiful speech he gave about education. He gave very many, by the way. And they all say the same thing, which is interesting. I'm going to give you a contrast of what we say about it today, what you have heard growing up. He says, uh, he says uh, let me say a word for the late starters. He was a late starter. He said, some, in some people, he said, they're not ready to learn the things that are the best to learn. Churchill, you know, he wrote 50 books. He wrote 1,000 articles. He had 16 exhibitions, solo exhibitions at the Royal Academy of his paintings. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature. He got honorary degrees all over the world. And he always said the same thing at them. He said, you know, I was never very really good when I was a kid at getting a degree like this. I couldn't, I, examinations were not my thing. But I found a way to get them. He said, don't study, they'll just give them to you. <laughs> it's, it's very self-deprecating, right? He says, uh, you, should, you, should, you should listen to this right here. You should go to work on this today. And I tell you, it will take the rest of your life and most of your energy if you do it. Churchill writes, at this time when learning, well, the want of learning comes upon him, he says, I caught myself using a good many words, the meaning of which I could not define precisely. GSD, right? What is that thing? What is it in principle? What does it mean? When I use the word, he says, he says, I admired these words, but was afraid to use them for fear of being absurd. 
One day before I left England, a friend of mine had said Christ's gospel was the last word in ethics. What is that ethics? You should start now. More than you have. How, and even if you have a lot, and you will have more than most people your age, you should redouble your efforts to learn what things mean. And you should do that because you are a human. That's what humans do. Now, what do we think about education today? I'm going to use only Republican examples. And the reason is, I'm a Republican, and you guys are young and smart and well-placed. You're probably not. <laughs> but I want you to know, this is a bipartisan thing. We are cooperating in America for this thing. In the George W. Bush administration, there was the No Child Left Behind Act. And uh, I was asked to help with that act. And the guy they sent to talk to me was an important guy. And I was in the college business by then. And I said, ooh, that's a bad title. He said, bad title? That's the greatest title. I said, really? Have you ever been in a classroom? I mean, doesn't somebody get left behind every day? Then they got to work and catch up? And the point is, the learning is in the student. Blitz over there, who's one of the most knowing men I know, right? He worked for that. He had these natural gifts. It doesn't matter that his, his teacher, Harvey Mansfield, also Charles's teacher, it doesn't matter that Harvey Mansfield knew a lot. Mark Blitz had to learn it just like Harvey did. See, isn't that true, right? Don't you know, that, isn't that true in your own case, in every case? I know before I became a teacher, which I only, I resisted doing all my life, I used to always say the reason I know the things I know the most about are because I actually had what I believe are the two greatest teachers in the, in the world about those things, Martin Gilbert about Winston Churchill and Harry Jaffa about the American Revolution and the Civil War and Aristotle. I think they're the man. And I used to always go around and say, yeah, I had those guys, that's why I know anything. But then later, as I started teaching, I, I started to notice that not everybody learned the same. I was the same person all the time. And then I remembered, you know, those guys that I studied with, they had a lot of students. What became of them? Who learned? Who listened? Do you find it exhausting to learn? Do you get dark circles under your eyes? Don't, don't you dread it? when finals come and you've got papers to do and it's a huge moral test, that's the price. You want to do it well, that's what it costs. Not everybody pays. Not everybody has the capacity to pay. But at least as important as the capacity is the willingness to pay. And I think that this No Child Left Behind Act, what it gave rise to was a regime that dominates K through 12 education today uh, in which there are these state standards and the kids are encouraged to pass the test. And they've caught several whole school districts, they've been prosecuted for giving the kids the answers because they'll get a raise. Whereas, what about the joy of it? What about following it wherever it goes? What about running, what about, I wanted to know who Socrates was. And there is no practical reason to want to know that. That guy's been dead a long time. Worse than the No Child Left Behind Act is something called the National Commission on the Future of Higher Education run by the Secretary of Education, Margaret Spellings. She was Bush's education policy aide when he was the governor in Texas. And she and Bush and a man named Clint Miller invented this regime, Republicans all, of national testing and standards to dominate K through 12 education. And they decided to bring that to the college world. And you know, I happen to run a college and it does a lot to try to be independent of the United States Department of Education, where I have been many times and never met anybody who could define the term. And I said, uh, to them, she gave a speech to start it. She said, you know, she said, uh, 
We need to compete with China. We're getting behind. We've got to have a national effort, just like after the Sputnik, which got us to the moon. I pointed out to her, I said, you know, the Sputnik was launched in 1958, and the first federal aid education started flowing in 1961-62, and we landed on the moon in 1969. And it takes four years to get a college education, and at least five to get an engineer, advanced engineering degree or a PhD. And that means that no one who benefited from that act had anything to do with the moon landing. They were all a bunch of old guys. It's a simple point of chronology. She was very angry with me about that. And then they, they did this report, and the report leaves out some subjects. Bruno said about STEM, right? That's all that's in there. They don't mention history or literature or philosophy. They don't mention happiness or goodness. They don't mention religion or morality. They don't mention government. It's a government thing, right? They don't mention the Constitution of the United States. They don't mention anything. Do you know what that word, Constitution, means? Big word, fundamental word, look it up. You see, they don't mention any of that. And I pointed that out to them. And they said, well, that's just up to our own selves. Each family and each school and each person should make up their mind about that. Whereas in science, there are facts. And I said, do you see what you said? You have just said that everything that is not quantifiable in mathematics is just a value. And the next thing you know, you're going to run out of arguments for opposing Adolf Hitler. Terrible things have flowed from that. Did you know that? When's the last time you guys were accredited here? We just were in April. Second time, you know, we're, it, it's not that hard to get accredited because there are 2,500 colleges and most of them are not very good. So you should be able to pass the dang standard. But the process, I've done it twice now, every 10 years, is completely revolutionized now. Now it's all filling in boxes. And the accreditors who are highly educated, in my experience, always very fine people, show up and ask only the prepared questions for them. And now for the first time, after these very distinguished people come and take out part of their lives and spend five people, spend five days on your campus, and a month reading everything about it, and you have spent a year and a half writing up the story of your campus. And that means all of a sudden these experts show up and they look at you with a new eye and they can tell you things. Now that the process has fallen completely under the control of the Department of Education, they are forbidden to tell you what they think. And that means the people who know the best, who've seen the most, they actually have to leave and not tell you anything. It's like automatons. I said, because I'm an indiscreet person, I said, do you like that? And they all just looked at each other. You see? One of them uh, said to me, I, I've been paid high compliments by a couple of them, because Hillsdale College is not the greatest college in the world, but it might be the most focused. We get up in the morning on what we're supposed to do, and what we're supposed to do was written in a document in 1844 by friends of Abraham Lincoln. And we never forget that. And so they come and they admire that. And one woman said, you know, you don't charge much here. And I said, we don't. And he said, you have a lot of applications. And I said, we do. And she said, you could charge more. I said, we could. And she said, you don't. And I said, no. And she said, why? And I said, because we want the ones we want. We want you guys, people like you, people who can think, people who will get those dark circles in their eyes and be committed. And see, you can't quantify that. And I, I promise you, you will discover later, you're not doing that for money. Especially when you figure out how to make a living, which you will. Then you'll find that that falls away as a concern. Now back to Winston Churchill. Because here's the amazing thing. This man who made speeches all over the world about how he was a poor student and never learned, and exaggerates that, because we have his school records. We know what he, he was good. He just wasn't great, you know. And he wasn't great because he was inconsistent. And he was inconsistent because he wanted to be. He wanted to do a bunch of other stuff. 
like cavalry charges and stuff, even when he was a kid. Do you know, even when he was 16 years old, he said to a friend, he said, uh, <laughs> I am going to save London. It's going to be attacked, and I am going to save it. You know, a bunch of 16-year-old boys standing around talking about what they're going to, I'm going to be a lawyer, I'm going to be an astronaut, whatever they're going to be, right? I'm going to save London. I'm going to lead my country in a desperate struggle and save it. And they laughed at him, and he, he meant it. He wasn't serious. You see, that guy, he, let me show you what he wrote about education. At the University of Miami on February the 26, 1946, that's seven days before he gave the Fulton Address in Fulton, Missouri, that opened the Cold War, one of the greatest speeches he ever gave, and I think one of the greatest ever. But he goes to the University of Miami, and they give him an honorary degree, of course. And here's how he ends the speech. He says, uh, this is an age of machinery and specialization, but I hope, nonetheless, indeed, all the more, that the purely vocational aspect of university study will not be allowed to dominate or monopolize the attention of the returning servicemen. In other words, the largest group of men and women ever assembled to fight a war are coming home and they've been through that trauma. And of course, what everybody says today, especially but back then too, is we have to retrain them so they can find their job and be of service to the society and then heck, we can compete with China or whatever the point is. Not dominate the attention of the returning servicemen. Engines were made for men, not men for engines. Mr. Gladstone said many years ago that it ought to be a part of a man's religion to see that his country is well governed. Knowledge of the past is the only foundation we have from which to peer into and try to measure the future. Expert knowledge, however indispensable. Do you know that one of Winston Churchill's closest friends was one of the premier Oxford physicists of his day, Professor Lindemann, and they were close. And of course, Churchill helped to invent the tank thought of the idea himself first, helped to invent the military airplane, one of the first to think of the idea, helped to invent the nuclear bomb. He knew the power of technology. He knew you'd never beat Hitler without it. And yet he says, expert knowledge, how, and Lindemann, who's a great man, Churchill made him a baron, Lord Charwell, Lindemann knew this too. That's why they were friends, he said. However indispensable, is no substitute for a generous and comprehending outlook upon the human story with all its sadness and all its unquenchable hope. People are not to be deployed as tools. Instead, they are ends. And they must know the things that things that are ends know. They must know ends. Here's what he said. I'll read one more quote, two more quotes. In 1953, he's prime minister again, and he appoints this very nice lady, Horsborough, to be the education secretary. And she starts doing this huge thing on adult education, right? That's the fancy now, isn't it? You know, teach them square dancing or something to amuse their time or retrain them so they can get another job. Churchill says he held the thing up. He wouldn't let her go forward with her bill until he, she got it the way he wanted and then he carried it in the House of Commons. And by now, by the way, he's the greatest man alive. That's what everybody thinks. People, the people who hated him before, they still hate him. And the people who loved him before, they still love him. But they now loved and hated the greatest man alive. That's what everybody thought about him. There is perhaps no branch of our vast educational system which should attract more within its particular sphere, the aid and encouragement of the state than adult education. How many must there be in Britain after the disturbance of the two destructive wars who thirst in later life to learn about the humanities, the history of their country, the philosophies of the human race, and the arts and letters which sustain and are borne forward by the ever-conquering English language? Now, that'll sound like uh, bigotry to the modern in ear, but remember what he means by that. Human beings have the gift of speech and no other beings do. 
and that we get along by language and talking or else we fight. Churchill always knew that. This ranks, he says, in my opinion, far above science and technical instruction, which are well sustained and not without their rewards in the present system. The mental and moral outlook of free people studying the past with free minds in order to discern the future demands the highest measures of which our hard-pressed finances can sustain. Now see, remember, he's a statesman. He makes laws and he enforces them. And what he's telling is we have to teach people to think these things through for themselves. It is at once one of the most important things he ever wrote after he wrote about how the Bolshevik society has adopted the principles of the white ant, not bees they can't make any honey. It's like the termite. But he says, human nature is more intractable than ant nature. It is the glory and the safeguard of mankind that it is easy to lead and hard to drive. Memorize that, I have. It means, like if you run a business, I do. Just remember that about people. If you let them do their jobs and agree with them how they're going to do it, there is no reason for conflict and they love you for it because they get to do their jobs, just like you in every class you take. I'll read the last thing because what I'm saying is, in this subject of education, we discover the reason that, Ad that Winston Churchill recognized Adolf Hitler for the animal that he was, but worse than animal, much more terrible. In one of his very greatest speeches, Churchill in the 36, he says, you know, who are his enemies? He said, not just Jews, scientists, philosophers, people who write and think. He says, uh, he says, what are they afraid of? Words. They terrify them. You see, unnatural and wrong. And here's the decisive plate where he put the point. I'm almost done. I read a book the other day which traced the history of mankind from the birth of the solar system to its extinction. This is in an essay called 50 Years Hence. It's one of the greatest things he ever wrote. There were 15 or 16 races of men which in succession rose and fell over periods measured by tens of millions of years. In the end, a race of beings was evolved which had mastered nature. Do you hope to do that? Do you hope Sometimes, young and enthusiastic and full of passion and love, do you hope that you can live a life where you can have anything that you want? He describes his life, he says, uh, they could live as long as they chose. They enjoyed pleasures and sympathies incomparably wider than our own, navigated the interplanetary spaces, could recall the panorama of the past and foresee the future. In other words, they're gods, you see? What was the good of all that to them? What did they know more than we know about the answers to the simple questions which man has asked since the earliest dawn of reason? Why are we here? What is the purpose of life? Whither are we going? No material progress, even though it takes shapes we cannot now conceive, or however it may expand the faculties of man, can be comfort to his soul. It is this fact, more wonderful than any that science can reveal, which gives the best hope that all will be well. You see, in a question, he found a certainty. In that question, you can find the meaning of your lives, and you won't find it anywhere else. There isn't any other thing to know. What is it to be a human and to repeat our table co conversation? And that means a good one. That's the message of Winston Churchill. Thank you.
All right, uh, we have uh, actually 40 whole minutes for quest Q&A. Uh, please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, to stand up when you ask your question. Please, in the interest of t time, try to keep them reasonably brief, and priority will have to go to students. Hey, uh, thank you so much for your talk. I was just curious um, for yourself, what were the three most influential books that you read throughout your life? Yeah, I was advised by Harry Jaffa. He was making probably a particular comment on me. He said, life is too short to read 100 books. I have a list of the three greatest books, he said. And I can repeat word for it. It's actually the first thing I ever heard in a graduate course right over there in Bower Hall, Nicomachean Ethics. And uh, he said, uh, his three greatest books were, uh, he said, Plato's Republic would have to be on any list. He said, Aristotle's politics would require some revision for the modern world. Seemed to be excluding it. The Bible is a different kind of thing. He said, Shakespeare. Socrates said a poet would come who could do tragedy and comedy equally well. And then he said, held up the Nicomachean Ethics and said, this is a perfect book, and we are going to read this book. So that's one of my three. And then I've read a couple of books by Winston Churchill that have meant a lot to me. And I like Shakespeare. The Bible is a different kind of thing, but also very important. You should uh, take the advice, because you understand now, you must be interested in your goodness and then your greatness. And that means you should pick the most worthy thing and you should think, I'm gonna be the most persistent person in history. No matter what I do for a living, I'm gonna be really good at those things. Pick a book, learn it. You'll have to read it 50 times. You'll have to read it, in my experience, 45 years. And if you do, all of a sudden, its arguments will be with you all the time. That's what Churchill did. He, uh, he went to see Macbeth. Winston Churchill and Abraham Lincoln's favorite plays were Macbeth. And Richard Burton records that uh, he was playing Macbeth and the great prime minister was sitting in the front row, already the greatest man in the world, and he was talking. And uh, Richard Burton was unnerved and he said it was in the second act that he realized that Churchill was reciting the lines from memory. Yeah, okay. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. So uh, in the spirit of Plato's Republic, um, what do you think about the tendency of many American colleges like CMC and Pomona College to uh, spend lavishly on luxuries that are not relevant to education. I know that Pomona is going to build a like $50 million gym, which is completely ridiculous. I would say, uh, so that's a clever question. Let me just condemn Jack Stark for the fool that he is. Uh, <laughs> no, I think the basic subjects in Plato's Republic might be music and gymnastic. Did I? Do I recall that correctly? Yeah, you need, uh, you know, so I do have a general criticism of colleges. It's just exactly like Churchill's. And I don't apply it to this one because I have a lot of friends who teach here and they're still happy here. It must not be bad. And, uh, and but what are most of them like, right? There's a, uh, you know, I was explaining to my table mates here, um, we swim in the sea today that uh, things gain their importance from what we think. Any claim of objectivity about any moral or principled thing is suspect and can lead to despotism, and we don't want to do that. And so that's something we have to liberate ourselves from. And we'll find out if we do it seriously that it's not easy to do that. Hard to know, but of course important to know. And, uh, and then the worst colleges, which have some correlation to the most elite, what they have is kind of a uh, police state running on them now, where you get a thwart of a cause, and 
you're shut up and silenced and uh, mustn't give the way that of that here. Because you remember, the word college means partnership. It's something we come together to do. We're supposed to love each other. We need each other to talk and opine and read together and think together. And we have to cultivate our friendship. And the only real agreement that you have to make is we're going to seek the truth and be good to each other. And you follow that rule and you can say anything you want to. So I would encourage colleges to do that. And if they're rich, you know, you know, I've never spent $50 million on a gym, but I've spent $35 million on a chapel. <laughs> yeah. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering, um, given that Churchill was quite unique in the way that he wrote himself into history and spent the majority of his life marketing himself to the world, um, how much do you think of that was true and correlates to the reality of his own life? You mean his fame or his reputation? Yeah, and what he achieved and how his life went. Well, you know, I think he was a very great man. And uh, I think he made, I think he learned a lot and he made a lot of mistakes by his own account, but also some that he didn't give an account of. But I think, you know, uh, it just so happened that he was put in places and he sought those places, see. It, like, and he became prime minister on the 9th of May, 10th of May, the evening of the 9th of May, 1940. And he'd always wanted that job. But by the time he got it, it was 60, he was 65 years old, and the situation was desperate, right? And, and you know, he says, uh, I felt as if I were walking with destiny. I went to sleep, and, and that all my, pri my life had been but a preparation for this hour and this tri trial. I went to sleep and slept soundly. Sometimes facts are better than dreams. In other words, in that terrible spot where he made that judgment that affected hundreds of millions of people, he wanted to be there. He thought he was made for that. So that's an enormous moral burden for somebody to take upon themselves. And that means that has to be vindicated by, you, you know what makes up a moral act? The, the virtue of the act is in the doer, not the deed. And it becomes moral if it wishes for the right thing and if it uh, exercises the ne necessary practical wisdom, which is never infallible, toward getting it, right? Did Churchill do that because he wanted to be the big dog? Because if he did, that's wrong. Did he do it because he thought he was made to do some act of justice? that other people were not able to do, and he was prepared to sacrifice for that? Because he did expose himself to gunfire all his life. So I think that, I think that the, the reason it's important to study somebody, you should pick, apart from picking a book, pick a person or an event. This is also Harry Jaffa's advice. For Jack Stark, Harry Jaffa, Jack Stark asked Harry Jaffa 400 years ago to write a sample honors program for Claremont McKenna and, ja and Jaffa did write one, and he gave a lecture over in Bauer Forum for it. You still have all that over here? Is that all still down there, Jack? And, uh, and uh, I remember it. it was a really great night, and it was a brilliant lecture. And it, it, he repeated the advice I'd heard him give in class, which was pick three books, or for an honors thesis, if you want to graduate with honors, demonstrate mastery of some important book and also of some important person or event. The reason you study people like Churchill is that you're just like him. You have to live your life. And you have these appetites, and you have these fears, and you have these wishes, and then you have something outside them, some sense of good or right. And how do you navigate between those things? Because we're the only beings like that, right? 
And, and Aristotle says that the sum of the virtues in this regard is, is practical wisdom, and it combines the right moral intention with good judgment. And he says, if you want to learn how to do that, that's hard, it takes experience. But the quickest way would be study people who seem to be really good at it, especially statesmen. And that, you know, Churchill's life, by the way, is a long string of failure and disappointment. In 1901, he, he forecast, he's 26 years old, and he'd been on these battlefields, and he, he fought in South Africa, in uh, Sudan. And he saw this battle. It was, the, it was a battle of British soldiers against the first Islamic Republic. And he was in it. He was in a cavalry charge. And he didn't like those radical Muslims. But on the other hand, he watched the British mow them down across an open field with automatic weapons and artillery. And that was a glory. Everybody in Britain was rejoicing at that because this guy, the Mahdi, had destroyed an, a, a British hero, a guy named uh, Chinese Gordon, General Gordon, a kind of picturesque, go around the empire kind of guy. Everybody wanted his, and Churchill was there so that he could perform and write a book and get elected to parliament. And he watched that slaughter, and he hated that thing. You should read in, in, in the, the River War called the Battle of Omdurman. He describes how the dervishes, that's what they were called back then, come over the hill. They had no idea of the impending tragedy. The white flags fluttered, but then they began to fall, and then more and row upon row. And it seemed, he writes, unfair, because they had not yet hurt us at all. And then he says, and then he, in the middle of the same paragraph, he, he shifts to the British line. He said, the infantry filed, fired steadily and stolidly. After a while, it became boring, but they were tedious, but they remained interested in the work. After a while, their barrels began to melt, and people were carrying ammunition and water jackets. He's describing a factory. You see? And he said, and after each volley, there seemed to be fewer of them over the site. 35,000 dervishes charged across about a mile, about 20,000 British, and the one that got the closest to the British line got within 150 yards. That means a football field and a half. They could still hardly see it. Churchill hated that. And in 1901, he forecast, that's what war is going to be for both sides. And we have to stop that. Before both world wars, he fought like a man. He just flew all over the place, trying, sailed all over the place in the first one, trying to find a way to prevent the war. He failed. You see? A failure. That's what he was. And then his other great cause was he thought that modern society, we are producing through modern science powers that can eventually overwhelm us. Administrative powers, not just war powers. His most impressive essay about the danger of war is called Shall We All Commit Suicide? Which he wrote in time of peace because he didn't write things like that when, you know. Remember, this is the man who didn't just say, no, we will not make a peace with Hitler. He talked the rest of them out of it. How did he do it? He said, uh, I've been thinking, so first of all, the war cabinet was going to quit. And if Halifax or Chamberlain, either Halifax looked close to it, had resigned, then the Churchill government would have fallen. And that means he couldn't stop it, see? So what he did was, he just called a cabinet meeting. The whole, the war cabinet was five people, the cabinet was 25, 24 people. So he got them in a room, and he gave them a speech. The speech is not written down, which is rare for him. But two guys wrote down in detail what he said, and they agree, pretty much. And. Uh, he gets to the end of it. He, he describes the situation. He says, it's desperate, you know. There's going to be a great battle for the channel. It'll be mostly an air battle. He says, if they land, I remind you, he says, that there are towns in southern England that have towns of the same name in North America. And will they come to help us? It's the responsibility of the United States of America. 
And then he said, I've been thinking in these last few days whether it is part of my duty to open negotiation with that man. And I believe that if I were for a moment to consider parley or surrender, every one of you would rise up and tear me down from my place. If this island story is to end at last, let it end when each of us lies choking in his own blood upon the ground. And they rushed up and they celebrated. That's how he persuaded them. And then you have to see, he's the last man in the world to have wanted to do that. He argued against it all his life. And then he, didn't, he, he invented the social safety net with David Lloyd George mostly. And he did it in part because he wanted to, he wanted everybody to have a stake in the society. They would be insurance schemes and that would give stability and constitutional stability to the government. To the, to the, to the, and he wanted everybody to vote. You know, he helped overturn the power of the House of Lords. And the point is, he thought socialism would lead to barbarism, finally, right? Well, in 1945, they beat him, you know, devastated him. What does that mean? That means that you're looking at a spectacular series of failures, and yet still a tremendous thing from which one can learn. Is there not a lesson for our own lives in that? You know, we're not going to get our way very often. Can we do the right thing anyway? Being such an expert on Winston Churchill's writings and words, if, if you could just uh, boil down what you think are the most important lessons he teaches for communication and persuasion, what would you say <laughs> those are? Well, so first of all, it helps to start out as a genius. And uh, second, he worked at that leaves a record of how he worked at that. To write, you know, he wrote and rewrote. You know, he, he wrote everything he published, he wrote it 10 times or more. He got really fast at it, but then over and over, because he started dictating, you know, and he, he lived his life, you know, really determined human being. He was broke most of his life. And yet, he had a household establishment that always con con included at least seven or eight secretaries who would be around to take dictation from him from about 8 in the morning until about 2 in the morning. So he worked at it. And then he studied the classical things, right? His teacher, the headmaster of Harrow School, was one of the great 19th century translators of Aristotle, especially of Aristotle's rhetoric, whose translation of the rhetoric was the standard thing for about 50 years. And so he knew about all that. The first essay he ever wrote is about the scaffolding of rhetoric. And then about writing, he was really good about writing. You guys are good writers? Probably not, learn to be, right? He, here's the thing he says, he says, uh, a sentence, a word, first of all, that's a thing with an integrity, a dignity, it means something. Pick the right one. He says in Education at Bangalore, I loved the sound of words falling into place like pennies in a slot. Pick the right word. And then the second thing is, a sentence is something. There's just one thought in it. Do you guys write run-on sentences? Banish them. They're ugly. They're awful, right? Don't, don't use the passive voice. It's got mostly some, but it's, you know, it's action. This does this. This does this, right? It makes it punchy and clear. And then a paragraph is something. And it's got a, and then, you know, a chapter and a book. And so the point is, everything is coherent when you write. And that means you've got to think it through again and again. And then if you get good at it, you'll become persuasive to people. And that's an enormous force for good, or you could be Hitler and use it for evil. Yeah, so, yeah, they, he cultivated that. But, you know, he was a gifted individual, not like most of us. Okay, is that enough? Thank you all. I don't know. I'm, I'm not in charge here. 
<laughs> All right, uh, well, it does look like it's enough because we seem to have exhausted our question supply. So please join, oh, um, but before we end though, uh, President Arn, we do um, allow speakers to give uh, closing remarks if they have any, if they have any. So do you have any? I've been blowing off all time. Uh, good for you guys. Study hard. The most important thing, be good. And learn what that means. All right, thank you, President Arn.